Hi, welcome to another Retronaut video. So today we're going to unbox a recent purchase of mine. Uh, it was made on eBay and it was bought from somebody in Canada. It's an Amiga 1000 and uh, this machine is something of a holy grail for me because back in the day I really really wanted one of these machines but um, it just wasn't affordable. I'm going to talk about this in quite a bit more depth in another video so I'm not really going to the particulars of it here but uh, needless to say I really wanted this machine and I just couldn't have it. I did eventually get an Amiga 500 like many many people but I suppose there still was a seed inside me that you know wanted the machine. And uh, so that's why I've been looking out for an Amiga 1000. Now, as I said, they're, they're relatively common compared to something like, say, uh, a Nex workstation. But, you know, they are becoming rarer and um, a lot of them weren't really looked after that well because they weren't really that useful compared to some of the later machines. So I think they got discarded basically by, by owners. I've been looking for one in good condition for maybe a year. And to be honest, the market for these on Ebay's right now is really toxic, in my opinion. It's become really normal to sell Amiga 1000s without its keyboard. And then what people do is they sell these separately. And they're asking for prices of anywhere between $100, $200, $250. You know, quite a lot when you think about that you can get a, an entire Commodore 64 for the price of just the Amiga 1000's keyboard. The keyboard itself uses a very specific connector. It's a very specific keyboard, right? It's the Amiga 1000's keyboard. So ideally, you would like to get that keyboard with the machine. But anyway, it looks like, you know, it's a gouge festival on eBay right now with Amiga 1000. So there you go. You, you've got to be very careful when buying one. Even worse than this is the fact that when you do see a lot of machines uh, listed on eBay at the moment, Amiga 1000's anyway, for some reason, they're in terrible condition. I've, I've seen quite a few recently that are broken, They've got the memory hatch uh, missing for some reason, um, obviously lost along the way. And uh, some of them even have what looks like water that's been running down them, uh, rusted, so on and so forth. And uh, even in this condition, I've seen people asking for uh, 300 pounds, which would be about what, $375, something like that, um, for a broken machine in terrible condition, right? And even worse, this machine wouldn't even have a keyboard. So uh, yeah, it's a bit ridiculous really. If you do want a working machine, then you're gonna pay something more like 800 pounds, like $1,000. And uh, if you're lucky, it will have a keyboard, uh, but not always. But this is where I actually had some luck. As I said at the beginning of this video, there was a vendor in Canada and they were offering their machine on eBay for 300 pounds. Um, I think that was 750 Canadian dollars or near a offer. And uh, so I thought, okay, maybe if I offer a little bit above their price um, rather than lower, they'll go for it. So I put in an offer for uh, 320 and uh, yeah, they were interested and they accepted. Now, this machine was uh, amazing because it was in relatively good condition. I think there was a break underneath the case. The keyboard is a bit yellow. Well, it's very yellow, um, but that's okay because I've got this thing I call the Uvenator which is basically a box um, with some reflective uh, sort of uh, vinyl on it and uh, some UV lights. But it works really, really well as a retro brighting system. So I'm pretty confident I can make the, the keyboard look uh, like new again, hopefully. And I'll talk about the Uvinator in another video because it's quite a cool system, pretty cheap to make. It does work. So yeah, I'll talk about that. I think it's probably the best uh, UV system I've seen. People these days are doing um, retro, uh, what's it called, vapor brighting, where you don't actually put the uh, items in liquid uh, peroxide. Um, and that's interesting, but this system could be used to do that, but it would need to be um, sealed. Yeah, because you don't want peroxide vapor getting into the room. Um, yeah. So 320, they accepted it. Payment was a little bit tricky. I was on tenterhooks, to be honest. I was wondering if they were using the payment difficulties as just an excuse for negotiating with other people. But what happened in the end was they did actually accept it and I did manage to get payment to them. And I think within about two days it was shipped. It took about a week 
to get out of America. It took a, sorry, yeah, that was a weird thing as well. It, it seemed to go through from Canada to America. Uh, then it got stuck in customs for a week for no good reason. I paid the duty on it immediately, but it just languished in customs for a week. That was quite annoying. Then the, uh, the UPS guy that was meant to deliver it said that they were going to deliver it between 10 o'clock and 11 o'clock in the morning. Sorry, no, actually, it was between 4 o'clock and 6 o'clock in the afternoon. And I went to get a coffee that morning. And by the time I come back, they'd already tried to deliver, which is really annoying. And they dropped it off at a local shop. Anyway, end of the day, I went to get it. And that box is now behind the camera. So what we're going to do today is we're going to open the box and see what condition it's in. And uh, hopefully um, it's not going to look too bad. Um, I had a sneak peek. I, I saw the, um, the keyboard cable in there. But apart from that, I've not really looked at it. What we're also going to try and do on this video, hopefully, is get it working. I need to verify for the vendor that it actually arrived in working condition. It was boxed really well. So I'm hoping that that's going to be, it's not going to be an issue. So yeah, let me uh, switch cameras and we'll have a look at uh, what we can see in the box. Now, I was going to go and get the box, but I realized that um, that was a bit silly, really, because I can just use magic to get it. So let's just uh, use magic and... And there we go. There's our box. So let's uh, have a look what we actually have. Okay, I'm just going to use my uh, Japanese uh, mail knife. There we go. I just put some tape on just to hold it together. Uh, I'd already opened the top. Now the, the vendor um, did pretty well because they actually put quite a lot of cardboard, uh, thick paper I should say, in the top and the bottom I think, hopefully, to give us some good pa uh, padding. So, so far so good. Ah, okay, there's the, um, there's the A4000's um, cable. It's a little bit dirty but uh, nothing too bad. Yeah, it's very dirty here. It just needs to be cleaned up. So that's good. We've got the cable. I think this looks like it's all actually quite loose. The vendor asked me if the um, customs officials had had a look at it and I, I think he's right. I think they did. Yeah, this is too loose. Look, it's been opened. So I have no idea what they were looking for. Drugs or something. I don't know. But uh, the keyboard, um, I've got to say my first impressions are it looks really good. Um, it's, well, in terms of physical condition, right? It's in really good physical condition. I can't see any cracks on it. Um, let's check the cable, make sure it works. Yeah, that plugs in okay. Um, it's very yellowed. Um, for some reason, these plastics don't seem to have yellowed at all, which is really cool. Um, so basically, it looks like the entire keyboard will just need cleaning, but not retrobrighting, apart from the space bar. And in a lot of these keyboards, for some reason, the, the space bars are nearly always in a different plastic. And it's in the same plastic as uh, the case, it looks like, and it's yellowed exactly the same. Uh, which in some ways makes it uh, good, easy, you know, because it's basically the same amount of yellowing that you have to remove on the space bar. Um, I've got a box with um, pretty good uh, retrobrighting setup. So I, I have a pretty good technique of how to do it now. Um, so I'm, I'm pretty hopeful. I think I'm going to get that looking really good. So that's good news. Okay, just put some more. This is just the box stuff, right? Just for the keyboard. Need to put that out of the way. I think this is the main event. I don't know what's going on here. Uh, looks like it's a box inside a box. So yeah, and it's been opened as well. Um, in fact, I can actually see the, um, the A1000 here. So yeah, somebody's definitely had this out. Interestingly, there seems to be a disc in the disk drive, which is good. That protects the heads when it's in transit. Um, and the vendors put bubble wrap inside. So I think it's really well wrapped overall. I mean, oh, that's quite hard to get out. Tell you what, let's... Uh, Let's pull this out of here, put this down here. Uh, and then I've got to get this out. It's probably wedged in here, isn't it? Oh, that's not easy. Uh, maybe we should, uh, 
Now let's just pull it out. Come on, up you come. It's like giving birth. Not that I've ever done that, of course. Or ever will. Oh. Yeah, it's like uh, it's like an episode of um, Very Peculiar Practice or some other veterinary program. Oh, yeah. It's really wedged in. Come on, right, you come. Maybe I can pull out the bubble wrap. Oh, there we go. There we are. It's coming up. Careful. There we are. Hey. Okay. And let's do some bub bubble wrap wrap around. Okay, well that's interesting. Right then. Let's put this down here. So interestingly, I think you can see that on camera, hopefully, the the keyboard and the um the actual machine are completely different colours. So yeah, obviously quite different plastics. This looks a little bit misaligned, although actually it pushes back into position, that's good. Um, it's very dirty, but that's fine. Dirty cleans. Uh, there's some kind of weird stuff going on here, which suggests that there was some kind of battery um, in the past, I'm not sure. There's the side connector. I guess this used to have a door in it. Looks like the door's long gone. Maybe a 3D print in the future when I get a 3D printer. The face of the machine looks really great. Um, the spring on this is not working. It's not popping out. Um, although it did actually pop out just now, didn't it? There we go. And when you put it in, it does engage. Maybe a bit of oil will fix that, hopefully. It's got the original Amiga badge on the front and on the uh, keyboard, and that's actually still got the original protection on it. So I'll keep that on for retrobriting to try and make sure we don't retrobrite the actual logo, keep the color. Side looks okay. Sounds quite positive. You know, the action, still quite clicky, which is good. They can, I think, age with time. Um, and then the back, we've got the power supply, and we've got, um, it says here, video. TV modulator, RGB, which is what I'll be using probably to test with, left and right audio, uh, serial port, disk drive, and parallel port. The disk drive is quite interesting because there's a there's a disk drive that was released with this same industrial design, and I think it's the 1010. Um, really cute uh, design. I'd like to get one. I don't really use disk drives that much anymore because they're very unreliable, um, but they're actually part of the whole feel of the machine back in the day. Um, and you know, this is one of the reasons why you bought these was because they had these newfangled disk drives. So um, I'll try and get some cash together at some point and get uh, one of those or maybe even two, because I think the 1010 you can daisy chain, whereas there was a cost reduced version later, the 1011, and that you couldn't, you can only have one. So um, yeah. Um, underneath, uh, there's the there's the cattle lead for the power supply. Um, looks like you've got an area here where you can keep stuff. I don't know what. <laughs> um, oh, comes the, the floppy. Ah, there's a label here. Put this over here. And the label says, um, do not repair unless authorized, otherwise it'll void your warranty. Obviously that's long gone. Um, I can't really, oh yeah, 120 volts here, 60 hertz, two amps. So this is not gonna work with the power supply here. We're 240 volts, or I think we've been normalized down to 220 volts now in the UK to match up with the U European Union. Not that we're a member of it anymore. But uh, yeah, we now run, I think, at 220 volts. But still, um, if you plug this machine into a UK power supply, it's gonna explode. I think the other way around, if you, ply, if you plugged um, a British machine, into American power supply, it wouldn't explode, but it wouldn't work very well, obviously, because it would have about half the power it'd be expecting. Um, but in this case, you're gonna have fireworks. So I'm going to have to get uh, some kind of transformer. Um, so it looks like Amazon's going to get an order today. And once we've got that transformer in, uh, in a future part of this uh, video, we'll plug it in and uh, we'll make sure that it's working. Um, I'm not sure these feet, 
should be that like this. It's weird that they're kind of recessed. Uh, maybe we've lost the feet. I don't know. That seems strange. Um, there's a crack here. The vendor told me there was a crack, so he said expect that. And, um, and there's a piece of metal here, which is a bit weird. I'm not sure if that's meant to be like that. Uh, let's turn it back over. There we are. Um, I, I'm really happy with the way it looks so far. Um, let's plug this in just to give you an idea what the original machine looked like. Yeah, that clicks in really nicely. Um, and that's the look of the original machine, which I think is, is a great looking machine. Um, this was like a bay where you could actually put your keyboard when it wasn't being used. Very neat. Put your uh, monitor on top and um, yeah. I mean, this back in the day, if I could have afforded it, would have been a wonderful machine because it would have been, you know, it would have seen you in the sort of PC era of uh, microcomputers. The only problem is, of course, that the Amiga 1000 is flawed in that it didn't really have much expansion potential, despite the case. The case is big, but it's not big enough to have anything like slots in. And that was only really remedied when they released the uh, A2000. So yeah, it's interesting that, you know, they had such an amazing platform, but they just made a few mistakes in the design that kind of compromised it really. Let's pop this back in. I think that's looking pretty good. Very difficult to tell that it works without uh, the 120 uh, volt, uh, I think it's gonna be a step down transformer. So I'll get that order in um, and it's gonna take a few days, but I think once we've got it here, we'll carry on and we'll test this machine. So let me go and get that ordered. So it's a few days later and the, uh, the power transformers actually turned up the uh, step down transformer from 220 to 110. Uh, this takes 120, but I'm uh, informed on the internet that 120, 110 are fine. So the plan for this video was to uh, disassemble a machine on camera. And um, I actually did try to do that, but it turned into a bit of a bun fight. Um, and the reason for that is that the uh, previous owner of this machine or previous owners, somewhere in its history, something very bad happened with one of the screws. And honestly, it was a nightmare. I thought at one point I was gonna break the case, getting it open. So um, this has already been disassembled. The screws are on uh, a table uh, behind the camera. And uh, there were a lot of different screws where they should have been the same from what I could see. The main screws that went in the case were just very, very difficult to get out. Uh, the Phillips screwdrivers, which were the right size for them, were just not gripping them very well. Um, so yeah, not, not very good screws really. Um, I do have a bag of uh, old computer screws from the 1990s onwards. So I'm hoping to replace some of the ones which were here uh, with those, um, but we'll see how that goes. So I'll show you uh, the screw in, in, in question. So it's this one here, which was an absolute nightmare. So I'll explain uh, and I'll zoom in on this later uh, and show you this up close. So hopefully you can see that now. So what actually happened is that uh, there is a broken off screw in the header. Um, and what somebody has done is rather than not use this header, they've still tried to put a screw in and it's gone down the side of the header and actually burst out the side of the stand. So I hope you can see that. Um, yeah, and that was very, very difficult to uh, get out. Even worse than that, if I put this down here, um, oops, um, I don't know if you can see that there, there's a small hole in the top of the uh, RF shield there. Uh, this hole is much bigger, and the reason for that is that the actual screw head went through the hole. So um, the screw head went much further into the case than it should have. It burst out the side of the actual, uh, uh, casing there and it uh, it ended up, the head of the screw ended up inside uh, on the other side of the metal shielding. And that was why when I was trying to pull it out, you know, untighten it and then pull it out, it wasn't happening. Uh, so all of these suffer from that to a certain uh, degree. When you unscrew them, they just pop and they don't seem to disengage. Um, I don't know if that's because they're bird or the type of screws that are currently being used, but um, they're very, very difficult to open. Um, anyway, we got in there eventually. Uh, here is the, the famous uh, Amiga 1000 uh, case where all of the Amiga team um, had their names, uh, their signatures uh, built into the actual uh, mold. Um, you've got uh, J Miner's name here. 
and his dog, uh, the paw print there. Um, I'm not sure if that's really the dog's paw print, but it's a nice touch. I think the only other machine I can think of which has this uh, particular uh, feature is the um, Apple II GS, um, and that's got Steve Wozniak and the rest of his team's uh, names inside it. I don't know which came first. I think the Amiga did actually. I'm not sure, maybe it was around the same time. But yeah, it's really, it's really nice that they cared enough to have their names actually uh, written into it. And it's really nice that Commodore allowed them to do that because don't forget the Amiga 1000 wasn't really um, a Commodore project to begin with. It was kind of bought in. Um, so when I was taking the case apart, uh, obviously I, I managed to get the front cover off in one piece, which is great. Doesn't seem to have any damage on it. Although actually this uh, screw here seems to have had a bit of a hard time. I would say that was the theme of this case. You know, uh, somebody in the past has decided that every single screw needs to be put in, even if it's not working. Um, and this screw is obviously the, the crazy one that just made it almost impossible to take apart. Um, when I took this off, the memory expansion pack turned out to be inside. So it does actually have 512K rather than the 256K that came with the Amiga 1000 originally. Both the Amiga 1000 and the Amiga 500 were kind of plagued by that actually. Um, fantastic architecture, but it needed more memory, you know, to, for, for it to be vi viable. Um, both the Amiga 1000 and the 500 are, are kind of like mini computers um, in a small case. And if you look at mini computers, they never have 256K. It's always a lot more memory than that. It's just a different architecture and you just need to have more memory to allow it to do what it does. Um, and yeah, it was underspecified in the beginning by Commodore and they, they got around it by allowing these expansion packs. But you know, even this one, if you think about it, only takes you up another 256K, which isn't really that much. And I don't think they ever offered a bigger expansion than this one. So that was one of the things that uh, held back this machine. If we take off the RF shield, which is a little bit jammy, here we go. Um, it looks to me like it's been spray painted with silver paint. I don't know if you can see that. Um, it looks a bit scratched up in places here. This looks more like natural. And this is actually the, the natural metal here. So this is definitely silver paint. So I think maybe somebody's tried to um, retouch it a bit, maybe to make it look a little bit better. Um, inside here, everything looks pretty cool, except for the fact that the, um, the screws that are meant to hold the uh, floppy disk uh, RF shield down to the joystick ports, the mouse ports are missing. I have no idea what happened to those. I'm hoping my, my little bag of tricks has some screws to remedy that. To be honest, it's not really a big issue. It's not exactly moving around, it's pretty solid. So um, I don't think we're missing the fact that those screws are gone. Uh, but this is a classic example that I found in this machine. You'll have this screw here, which is like a, a hybrid Phillips and flat blade screw. And then next to it, you'll have a uh, Phillips screw. I don't know why, there's just a mixture of screws in here. It's like somebody lost all the screws and just decided to replace them with different things. The, uh, the RF shield is missing as well from the, um, the oscillator, uh, the clock oscillator. And the reason why that was there, I actually read up in the technical manual is because the, the oscillator can produce uh, radio frequencies because it's uh, running at 28 megahertz. So Commodore decided to put that can on it just to stop it uh, causing any radio interference and, and it's just gone, it's just not here. Um, to be honest, these days, it's not that much of an issue. It will possibly inter interfere with, um, oh, I don't even think it would actually interfere with Wi-Fi these days. It's, it's higher frequency, I think, isn't it? But anyway, the ground plane here looks a little bit uh, worse for wear. That's something we'll look at when we take it apart. I've looked at all the caps. They all look, uh, I think they're new, to be honest. I think it's possibly been recapped. Um, the daughter board is here. I think that's where all the magic happens in terms of kickstart. I've looked inside the power supply. Again, it was quite difficult to get apart because one of the screws was, this one here was screwed in so tight it was almost impossible to get it off, but I got off eventually. Uh, liberal amounts of uh, WD-40 to get the screws out. Sometimes it helped, sometimes it didn't because of whether it was a mechanical issue or whether it was an actual um, corrosion issue. Now, at the back of uh, the power supply here, there's actually visible water corrosion. So it's possible that the machine at some point lay on its side like this, and it actually may have got wet uh, there because that really does look like it's been in water. And there's this weird brown staining here as well. I don't know what that is. 
and it's on the inside and the outside of the case. So that's a little bit weird. Um, what we're going to do in the remainder of this video is we're just going to test the power supply. And to do that, I've actually got my uh, multimeter here. I haven't used a multimeter in a while. I'm not an electronics whiz kid, whiz kid. So I need to put it into DC mode. So just put it into DC mode here. And what I need to do now is I'm just going to go off camera for a second and get the uh, transformer plugged in. Um, I'm a little bit nervous about this. Never used um, a step-down transformer before, so hopefully nothing will go bang. Um, but let me just uh, get the transformer. Make sure it's off while we plug it in. Nothing should happen. I mean, I've un unplugged the power supply here. So I just need to plug this in underneath here. Okay, and it's plugged in. Okay, here goes the moment of truth. So let me just turn this around so I can see this. I'm just going to flip this on very quickly and then flip it back off again just to make sure that we don't, if we, you know, get an explosion. So fingers crossed, here goes. Okay, I can hear a buzzing noise. Apart from that, nothing else going on. This power switch here is off. I'm going to turn it on. The fan is turning. Hopefully you can see that there. It's actually quite a quiet fan. I've seen other videos on Amiga 1000s and uh, whatever fans they use were pretty good because they're actually pretty quiet. Um, and obviously it's just blowing air through the power supply. I don't know if that actually... That's actually sucking air this way. Okay. So uh, let's get this and let's see what we've got here. So we've got purple, orange, black, black, red, and gray. So I'm assuming, uh, let's just pop this in to the black and let's try the gray. Looks like it's three volts there. Uh, into the red, five volts. Okay, so it looks like the red is five volts and the other red I'm assuming is five volts as well, yeah should be the same. And now the orange, 12 volts. Okay. And the purple, minus 5 volts. So we've got minus 5 volts, positive 5 volts, and we have negative 12 volts. Um, well, actually it says positive 12 volts, but I'm assuming it's, maybe it is positive 12. Okay. So, that looks okay. Um, I think we'll turn this off for a second. Make sure we get this the right way around, like this. And uh, let me just check that those voltages are correct before we actually try and power the machine up. Let's just make sure this is correct. So I checked online, and you gotta be very careful about what you read because um, it said that the voltages for this machine are uh, plus five, minus 12, and plus 12. And that's weird because we just measured it, right? And we saw two five voltages, negative and positive, and one uh, 12 volt. So a bit weird, I thought. I then went and checked the actual repair manual, which I found online for this, a PDF. And it says this is actually, uh, yeah, negative five, positive five, and one 12 volt. So there we are. Be careful what you listen to. Uh, the Amiga 1000 does seem to have different voltages. So I'm plugging this into the uh, RGB port. There we are. Let's turn on the monitor, make sure it's working. Very happy to get this. Bought this from a guy in Essex, which is a county just to the northeast of London. Uh, quite a big county. Um, I think that's working. Uh, maybe no signal. There was no explosion or anything. So let's now try turning on the machine, the moment of truth. Um, here we go. LED flash there. I don't know if you saw that. 
I'm really not sure if the monitor is actually plugged in. Disk drive activity. There we are, kickstart, wonderful. Um, oh, that is such a relief. Um, it's come all the way from, from Canada. It was stuck in purgatory for a long time with uh, UPS. Now, I can't really test this machine. Um, and the reason for that is I don't have the uh, kickstart disks. And I only have a limited studio. So the only way I can really get uh, kickstart disks is to get my Amiga 2000. Uh, which I have, um, which we'll show in another video. I'll have to get that set up. I think it has a real disk drive in it, from what I remember. Uh, then I'll have to download those Kickstart disks, write, the, write them to some floppy disks, and then plug this in. Um, that's something which we can do in a future video. Uh, I'm not going to bother with that for now, because I'm pretty much certain that it'll work, right? Um, it's asking for the disks. If the disk drive works, it's going to read the disks. Then you have to put in Workbench then you'll have a working Amiga 1000. What can we do in the future? So there's a device called the Passero, which is a Portuguese word. I forget what it means, but um, I guess it's going along the, the sort of tradition of the Amiga being a Spanish word for uh, girlfriend. It's also a Portuguese word as well, actually, for girlfriend. Um, and what it does is it, it gives you a few different things. It gives you eight megabytes of RAM. Um, it gives you a battery backed up clock, and it also gives you an SD card hard drive equivalent which are all fantastic. Um, what the Passero one didn't do was it didn't get rid of the need for the kickstart disks, which is still a bit of a pain, right? Because you have to put the disk in, wait for the disk to boot. Then you could probably then boot up into your Passero hard drive. There is a Passero 2, which I hope to get in the near future. Um, and the Passero 2 does actually then uh, fix those issues. It does actually give you um, an automatic kickstart in ROM. Um, I don't know how it works. Maybe it loads it off the SD card very quickly. Um, and then the other thing it allows you to do is it allows you to change that Kickstart ROM at will, basically. So you can have a Kickstart 1.2, uh, a 3, 3.1. Um, and then obviously you can run different versions of Workbench on top of that, which is really cool. Um, I know that there were issues with the Amiga 1000 in that it was very limited uh, from launch, but those things allow it to work much better. Right now, I'm using this, uh, as we can see, it's doing a good job, this 220 volt to 110 volt transformer. It might be an idea to replace the power supply in this. Um, it actually looks like it's in really good condition. Um, so I'm not really a big fan of gutting uh, old electronics unless it really needs it. But we could actually, um, in the future, replace the power supply. For now, I'm probably just going to use it with the transformer. Um, and the way I'm going to make sure that I don't blow the machine up is I actually found this US uh, power cable. So I'm going to keep that cable with this machine so I know that it's a 200, sorry, it's a 110 volt machine and I don't accidentally use like a normal British uh, kettle lead to plug it into the mains here and, and blow it to pieces. Um, might be an idea as well as if I put a label on it as well, uh, maybe on the back or something like that, just to make sure that I don't make a mistake. Um, what else can we do with this machine? Well, uh, what I'm going to do in the next video is I'm actually going to start uh, repairing it and uh, cleaning it and, and basically uh, getting it looking um, a little better cosmetically. We've seen in the previous uh, half of this video that the keyboard is very yellowed. Uh, that needs to be retrobrighted. So we're going to do that with the, uh, my Uvenator, as I call it. I'm pretty happy. Um, we did manage to get it apart without breaking it, which is a wonderful thing because believe me, it was very difficult to do. It does actually run. Hasn't reset, has it? No. Um, so there doesn't seem to be anything wrong with the machine. The machine seems to be solid. It's stable. It's not rebooting. It's just waiting for that uh, kickstart disk to be put in, which I don't have. Um, so yeah, that's it for now for this video. So I'd just like to ask you, as per usual, if you really like this video, please uh, click on the like button. Uh, if you're not subscribed to the channel, please subscribe to the channel. Um, and if you can, if you have any friends who are into retro computing as well, please recommend the video to them because we need to grow the channel so I can make more videos like this, obviously. Um, I hope you enjoyed this video and I hope to see you in the next one.